So last time I talked a little bit about synchronization. We're going to talk more about synchronization. I'll give you a bigger overview of what synchronizers are. But uh, to get you bootstrapped with the assignment 1B, I wanted to start talking about a particular example of a synchronizer called a semaphore. So we're going to start by talking about semaphores. And we'll focus initially on the concept of what a semaphore is. And then we'll start exploring how you program them with, with Java semaphores. And we'll also talk about the two different types of semaphores. And finally, there's a human known use, which I think I've used before, but it's always fun to reiterate it. And I'll try to put it in the context of the programming assignment that's coming up. So what is a semaphore? It's basically an, an object that can be incremented and decremented atomically. And it's used to control access to a shared resource, or perhaps a better way to put it, to a limited number of shared resources, such as Palantiri or beach volleyballs. It was originally designed to be used in the context of controlling access to shared railroad tracks. I think we talked about that before when we were doing the intro. So you could make sure that two trains were not on the same shared track at the same time in such a way that they would cause a collision or potentially cause a collision. So the word semaphore also has another meaning for people who are familiar with the history of naval operations. And they were flags that were used to signal commander's intent between ships. And there's a very famous flag semaphore sequence done by Admiral Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar, where he had his ship say, England expects every man to do his duty. And uh, that was a very key moment in the history of the British Empire. And in fact, if you go to, I think it's Portsmouth, England today, you will see his ship, the HMS Victory, with the signal flag set up to basically say that. So signal flags have, and semaphores have been around for a long time. Concurrent programs use these semaphores to coordinate interactions between multiple threads. And the way to think about this is, again, you've got some limited number of resources, and you'd like to be able to share them amongst those threads. So obviously, the Palantiri is a great example of this. Uh, I'll give you another example. Anybody who's a Grateful Dead music fan will understand why. Uh, I use this particular example. OK, so let's say we have a limited number of resources. So if you've ever heard of the Grateful Dead, it was a, a music group. And they have, a uh, they have a song called, We Can Share The. That's the, you know, that's the name of the song, We Can Share The, or something like that. And you can go listen to it. And so here we want to share something. So in this case, just for kicks, we're going to share bottles of Grateful Dead wine. Not that I'm advocating drinking wine. It just was a clever pun because they have a song called We Can Share The. So we're going to share the Grateful Dead wine. And I also happened to find pictures of Grateful Dead wine. I didn't even know that they had Grateful Dead wine before I did this course. So that's what we're going to share. And there's only a limited number of them. And in fact, that's the whole point of the song. We can, we can share your stuff because we've shared all of my stuff. So the semaphore starts out with a count that indicates the number of resources that are available for use. So we've got three bottles of Grateful Dead wine. And it's got operations that allow us to adjust the count as the units are acquired and or released. So let's say one thread comes along and it wants to have a glass of Grateful Dead wine. I don't even want to think about what the contents of Grateful Dead wine would be. If anybody knows anything about the Grateful Dead, um, who knows what they have in their wine. But um, one thread wants to have a glass of Grateful Dead wine, so they get the bottle. And that decrements the semaphore count by one. Then another thread comes along, and it gets a bottle. And the, sec the decrement of the semaphore goes down to one. So that means there's one bottle left. And now a third thread comes along, and it gets the third bottle. So we got three threads that have a bottle of Grateful Dead wine. And any other threads that come along that want a bottle of Grateful Dead wine are just going to have to wait until someone else is done with the bottle, and they put them back wherever you put a bottle of Grateful Dead wine, like in a wine cooler, I suppose. Um, so the point is that when the semaphore count drops to zero, then anybody else has to wait until somebody else puts back the bottle. When a thread or a person or whatever is done with the resource, it gives it back, and the semaphore count increases by one, meaning that someone else could come along and, and grab it. Um, so the key point is that these semaphore 
increments and decrements are done atomically, which means if multiple threads were trying to do this simultaneously, only one of them would get the chance to decrement or increment it at a time, and that's all protected in such a way you don't end up with the race conditions or memory inconsistencies or all the other hazards of concurrency. Any questions about this? Again, it's, it's just meant as a whimsical example, uh, not endorsing the Grateful Dead or the Grateful Dead wine. This is an example of fully bracketing the acquisition and release of what are called permits or the, the semaphore count. So the, the thread that got the semaphore, that got the bottle, is the same one that releases it. Not all uses of semaphore are fully bracketed. There are two types of semaphores. The first type of semaphore is called a counting semaphore. And basically, it has a count, just like the Grateful Dead example we looked at, which indicates how many permits are available. And to make it interesting, the count is usually greater than 1, although you can also have a counting semaphore with a value of 1. We'll talk about that in a second. So let's say we have n, where, to use our Grateful Dead example, we might have three, a count of 3 to start with. And this count has a precise meaning. If the count goes negative, that means that there's some number of threads waiting to acquire the semaphore, because now it's in the negative region. If the count is zero, that means there's nobody waiting yet, but whoever comes along next and tries to decrement it will have to wait, because it'll drive it negative. And if the count is positive, that means that if anybody wants to come along and acquire the semaphore, they won't block. So those are the three states. Negative, which means people are waiting, threads are waiting. Zero means nobody's waiting, but it's not available. Positive means nobody's waiting and someone can grab it, and they won't wait. The count will be incremented. And again, just think for a second about the Palantiri example or the Grateful Dead example. You'll kind of get the idea. The other form of semaphores are called binary semaphores. And binary semaphores are basically counting semaphores that only have the value 0 and 1. Um, so 0 you can think of as being acquired or in use, and 1 being not acquired or available. So those are the two typical types. Interestingly enough, Java only has one type called a semaphore, which does both of these things. And it all depends on what the count is. OK, so and that's what this point here, that's what this bumper sticker says, is that binary semaphores can be implemented by counting semaphores that are restricted to be 0 and 1. Any questions about the basic concept? As you can imagine, it's a very simple concept. Um, but as so often is the case in, in computing and software, things that are very simple are quick to understand intuitively, but tricky to use. And that's really a sort of a metaphor for all computing. Lots of things that are easy in isolation become hard in the aggregate. A great example of that would be assembly code. Assembly code is ridiculously easy to understand what each instruction does. It's like move a register to another register, add the contents of one register to another register, store the results of a register back to memory. What could be easier than that? If somebody hands you 50,000 lines of those simple instructions, your, your mind will explode because you'll be overwhelmed with details. We're going to show examples of both counting and binary semaphores later. I've already shown you counting semaphores a couple of times. The Palantiri Simulator app that we've got here uses a counting semaphore. The count indicates how many Palantir, how many Palantiri are available. So you can see if you have, you know, a semaphore with four counts, then you could have up to four active threads and so on and so forth. There's also another app, which we'll talk about later, called the Ping Pong app. I think I've mentioned it briefly before. And that's an example of binary semaphores. And we use that in a slightly different way. So the Palantiri Simulator app uses counting semaphores in a fully bracketed way in order to be able to ensure that there's only n beings or n being threads active on the n Palantiri at any given time. The Ping Pong app uses binary semaphores to coordinate the interactions between multiple threads to take turns doing ping and pong. And we'll talk more about that later. It is not fully bracketed. Yes, thank you for reminding me about that. That was meant to say that. So the ping pong example is not fully bracketed. And you'll see the way it works is that one thread acquires the semaphore, does its ping or its pong, and then it releases 
the other threads semaphore, and they take turns acquiring or releasing each other. So that's not fully bracketed. Yeah, great, great point. Thank you. Last little thing. I think I've talked about this before, so I won't belabor this point. But um, my favorite human known use of semaphores is the beach volleyball scenario I laid out before, where you've got a bunch of volleyball courts. Wouldn't you rather be playing beach volleyball today than walking around in the freezing weather in, in Nashville? Um, now you know why people who went to grad school with me took like 10 years to graduate at UC Irvine, because this was the other option besides studying. They could go play volleyball or go sailing or something. Um, this is actually the beach volleyball courts at Corona Del Mar, which is a beautiful beach in Southern California. And as you can see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And there's probably like a dozen or so beach volleyball courts there. But there's always more teams that want to play than there are courts. And so how do you coordinate access to that? You could have a basket full of beach volleyballs, and there would be one ball for each court. And the protocol would be each pair of teams that wants to play sends a representative over to get a ball. If they show up and there's a ball, they take the ball. And then they have to go find an available court. Because the fact that you got a ball doesn't mean you know which court you're at. It just means that there is a court. So you have to go find the court. And when you're done playing, let's say you, each, you play you know, three games each or whatever, you have to come back and put the ball in the basket or in the net. And uh, if you go to pick up a ball and there's no balls, that means all the courts are in use. So that's a great example where you have you know, M beings who want to play volleyball and N courts. And we use a semaphore. We use a way to keep track of that. Almost exactly the same as our Palantiri example. Except you get more exercise probably by playing volleyball than gazing into a Palantir. So that's the end of the intro. That, that kind of should give you a conceptual sense of what a semaphore is and a little bit of sense of how you can use it in the Palantir Manager app, but obviously not enough to really write the code. 